Super, I will take the screen share first and then let's introduce ourselves and let's get started. Uh, here, okay. Uh, I still need to adjust it a little bit. And a question to the studio, should I make it a little bit wider? It can be a little bit wider. How about this? Uh, looks good, yeah. Okay, so then just a little adjustment here. Okay, so first, Hello to everybody. This is really exciting. First time, first time we do something like this, and it's a pilot. And then later, later people can say, "Well, we were there when the pilot happened." Um, it, we, yeah, we are really excited. We are nervous. Um, my name is Hadvan Bast. I will be co-teaching this. So I'm at University of Chomso doing support in high-performance computing, but also in everything that is programming, software development in research. And really looking forward to teach this together with Diana from Sweden. Yeah, hi, yeah, uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, Diana Yushan. I'm uh, working uh, for the Uplux cluster uh, at Uppsala University in Sweden. Very happy to be here. I'm also doing uh, support for users as uh, Radovan been telling a little bit of RSE like. Uh, so yeah, really happy to be here. And we'll be teaching this uh, together with uh, Jarno and uh, Simo. So Jarno. Yes. Or maybe they'll introduce themselves. Maybe they'll later. later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the plan Let's now. Uh, let me let me show you where you can find everything. So hopefully you have this document that I'm sharing open. This is the these are our notes. Please ask questions here. And here you can also find all the links. So if you have one th one thing open somewhere in your browser, is this document. And here, please ask us lots of questions. We will be watching this. And this is now the best way to participate in the next two hours. We will have a break. So we will also take a break halfway through. And the, the next really two hours will be discussions, demonstration. And if you scroll up to the top, here you can also find all the, like the link to the material. I will open it up. So I will follow this link here. And if you open up this link, this is the lesson. And just to make it a bit more readable, I will zoom in. So what you what to expect? We will the next things we will now for the next 45 minutes, we will talk about really what is high performance computing in like two sentences. What is job scheduling? How do we schedule jobs on a high performance computing resource? We we are now on many clusters. I see that you are from different countries, different clusters. One thing that probably all clusters have in common these days is that they use a tool called Slurm. So we will tell you a little bit about the tool. And then using a visual analogy, we will then discuss two things. One is how to choose the number of cores. That's very important. And we will show you a method that almost always works and then how to measure and choose the right amount of memory and why it matters and how to do it again with a method that almost always works. And then we will discuss a little bit. We will take a break. And after that, we will talk about input output, how to use the disk in a good way. And later we will have an exercise session, which is optional. The exercise session will not be streamed, not recorded. And then we can try these things out hands on. But now the best way to participate is to watch what we do and ask us questions. So you don't have to type with us. All right, I will open up the first episode, which is job scheduling and Sloan basics. And we will show you a few pictures and discuss a little bit, but very soon, I will also open up a terminal. I will log into one of these clusters and I will test these things out. The learning goals is that we, we really understand what the job scheduler tries to do. What is the motivation for a job scheduler? We know what is the motivation for the researcher. The motivation for the researcher is to, you want your calculation to start as soon as possible and to finish as soon as possible. That's what you want. But I will tell you what the job scheduler tries to do. And then we will learn how we can work together with the computer. What are the dimensions of a job and how to specify them? 
but also understand that choosing good parameters will not only affect resource use, but also how long you wait in the queue. And these are things we, you want to minimize. And what we want to give you is a good visual understanding of what a job scheduler does. And I'm watching the questions, so please keep them coming. Any comments, welcome. What is a supercomputer or a cluster? Probably many of you already know. So I try to keep it really short. It's a large collection of computers. They are connected together through a network. And each of these computers is often called a node. And some clusters have thousands of these nodes. They have thousands of these little computers. And these compute nodes often have multiple cores. So when we talk about cores, we often use it synonymous to CPUs. But some of these compute nodes also have graphical processing units. What is surprising to when, when people start working on a, on a supercomputer or a cluster, and for me, a supercomputer and a cluster is the same thing. But what is surprising to people starting on supercomputers and clusters is that these, these cores are often not faster than the ones that are in my laptop. But the difference is there are many more. So in my laptop are, I don't know, six. And in on, on the supercomputer are, there could be 50,000. So it's not faster, it's more, sometimes faster. And then the nodes are connected through a high-speed network. The other thing that is different is they often share a common file system. So all of these many compute nodes, they can all read and write from a common file system. And we will, we will discuss what that means in the second part of today. And then when we log in to clusters to do our work, we typically log in through something called a login node, and then I will submit a job. I submit a calculation, which then waits in the queue until it starts, and then it runs on the compute node. So that's just for background. And of course, Diana comment, if I forget something really essential. Now I said that the one thing that is probably common to all the clusters that we are on today is a tool called Slurm is it is a tool that helps scheduling and queuing and monitoring jobs on these compute nodes. Jobs often have to wait a little bit before they start because the resource is limited. And one analogy is you can think of Slurm as like the maitre d' in a, at a restaurant. So the person who is at the entrance of a restaurant and if you want if you come there without a table booking, without a reservation, and you want a table for eight people, you might need to wait a little bit. And Slurm really works the same way. We have a limited resource, we have a lot of demand, and there needs to be somebody in charge of scheduling and making sure that, yeah, just managing the queue. It is, Slurm is the most widely used job scheduler these days. It's not the only one, but I think it's the most widely used one. And the visual, so there are different analogies. You could think about restaurant reservation or um, hotel reservation. The one analogy I will, we will use today is if maybe many of you remember playing this game here. So the blocks fall from the sky and you need to arrange them to fill up rows. So this is a Tetris game. And we can think of a job scheduler doing something similar. And here I try to translate it. Like, how does the, how does a job scheduler look at jobs? These calculations for a job scheduler they are often rectangular, so the, the, we don't have these like stair shape or T shape. All of these calculations are to first approximation rectangular. And here in, in this plot, I have there are different colors. And then the the job scheduler tries to arrange them. And what the job scheduler really wants to do is to keep the bottom row always full. And here the dimension could be the number of cores or memory or the number of GPUs. And the other dimension is time. So as time goes on, new blocks fall from the sky and Slurm is constantly busy arranging these blocks. 
So we can think of that the scheduler tries to keep the bottom row always full. So the motivation for the job scheduler is keep all the cores busy all the time. That's what the computer wants because it, because it was expensive. It is it would be a waste of taxpayer money to keep them idling. What is the motivation for me as a researcher? I want my job to get started and finished as soon as possible. And then there are long jobs that take a lot of time, but maybe only a few cores. In this case, it's this viola job here. So that it takes a number of time units, but not too many resources. And then there are the so-called wide jobs, this green, the green uh, set, which is lots of resources, but not very long time. And the cost of a job is the area of this, of these rectangles. You can think of it that way. And that is, of course, just a simplification. Now imagine there is one more dimension. So here we look at a 2D Tetris, but imagine the Tetris is 3D, three-dimensional or four-dimensional, because the third dimension could be memory. So what is maybe more realistic is that the scheduler plays kind of a cubicle Tetris all the time. And some of these jobs crash immediately. Some of these jobs are added to the queue but get cancelled, so they never start. And I think that's maybe a, so hopefully that's a useful analogy. But now let's what can we do with this? If we uh, so first of all, something I want to tell you is that to today now in the next 40 minutes we want to discuss these dimensions so how do i choose how do i tell my job whether it should use you know five blocks or or 20. how how, how do i choose the dimension number of course how do i choose the number dimension time and how do i choose the third dimension that we don't see here which is the memory how do i do it technically but also which number should i use so that's that's the goal for the first part once we accept that this is maybe a useful analogy, we can even understand concepts like backfilling. And to tell you what that means is, so that we have this situation currently, currently what is really running, the, so the, the processors, they are busy computing the bottom row. And they just finished the bottom row and now they will switch to the second row. So now they will switch to compute this one here the second row. And now imagine suddenly this pink, the pink job suddenly crashes. It crashes after two seconds. So, so what do you think will happen? Maybe question to my co-instructor. Yeah, so then the Torka is the top job is going to fill in that uh, space. Yeah, so the schedule would so notice that's... that uh, pink job crashes, suddenly there are eight of these places available. And in this situation, the job schedule doesn't have any, it will notice that hmm, I can actually move this one down here and it, it can start immediately. It can backfill. It can even start before the other green job starts because the green cannot start immediately. It doesn't have enough space for it. So something that the job scheduler cannot do, it cannot turn the pieces. It cannot do that. So now we also understand what backfilling means. So, and what I wanted to tell with this is that it matters how long the time the time a job is scheduled for will matter on how soon it can start. If a job is short and suddenly some resources become available, I can go in and and get the get the resources. Okay, and now how does it look really in real life? Here I have a example slum script so this is what this is how we tell the high performance computing cluster of what we want here is my computation i want to compute something currently let's not focus too much on what we do but i need to tell now here in this block i tell the scheduler of what what will i need and often you need to specify the account so this is the you have like a quote, quota of how many of these jobs you can run and how long they can run. So this is my this is my account. You give it a name, but here is the one dimension. This is the time dimension. 
this job here would run for five minutes. So minutes, seconds, hours, days. Often there is a limit on how, how long you can run on some of clusters in Norway. The limit is either one week or two weeks, but there exist clusters where the limit can be one day. Here is the other dimension, n tasks. n task is this number of cores, approximately. So in this case, I would ask for four cores. And here we ask also for the how much memory I need. So this is how you do it technically. So then the question is, is it a good idea to specify the memory needed for the job? On some clusters you have to. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to, uh, you can maybe leave it out and then it will take, it will assume that you want approximately the memory that the CPU has. On one of the clusters in Norway where I work, we, we have to specify it because it depends whether multiple researchers can run their jobs simultaneously on one compute node or not. And if yes, you often need to specify this because this is then also a limited resource. And depending on the cluster, you might need to specify more. Sometimes you need to specify something called partition because there are different partitions in the resource. And you can do a lot more. You can specify the number of nodes or how many of the, how many tasks per node. One can do a lot. I listed here some more options that might be handy one day, which is how is the, how are the outputs called? You can even make some calculations dependent on other calculations. So if you want one calculation to only start once the other one finishes, you can define dependencies. And you can even submit an entire array of jobs, of very similar jobs. And later in this course, it will not happen today, but one of the future weeks, we will, um, we will show you how, how do we split up a computation into smaller pieces so that we can run them as an array. Okay, a few more things, but then let's, then I will also demonstrate this. And what I will then also demonstrate that once we have such a so-called run script, once we have the job script, run script, then what we will do is we will submit it. We will, and the command that I will use is sbatch. With sbatch, I add my job to the queue. And I, went, I wait until the job scheduler tells me that now you can start. And instead of putting things into a script, you can also specify all of these things on the command line, which I personally recommend not to do because if it's in the script, I don't have to remember it. I can open it up half a year later and I can see what I did. If I did it on the command line, I cannot remember it half a year later. What I would add is that I, I also like to use the script. The uh, uh, the only time when I don't is if I want to do a test, uh, a quick test job, just to see that the inputs I have in my job script uh, are uh, correct, then I would just uh, add uh, in the command line a uh, shorter time for the job, just to see everything is working as, uh, as it should. And also another exception is uh, uh, when I use dependencies. Mm -hmm. I have those... Uh, in the command line and then I just uh, prepare different job scripts uh, in different folders or uh, as needed uh, for different uh, steps of my uh, workflow. Mm -hmm. And here I list two more useful things that I use all the time. So I really only remember a handful of these commands. One is to list all my jobs and sometimes I need to cancel a job. And you don't, so to all the, all the learners here, the goal here is not that we remember all these slum commands. Um, the goal is what Diana and me will try to show you is how do we think about the job? How do we approach a job so that we choose these parameters? Because it's easy to look up, well, how do I specify it? Here, this is how. But what, what, what is much harder and I find really important, how do I choose the number? Should it be four or should it be 40? And should this be five minutes or should it be five hours? And that is that is the goal of today. So I will scroll down and this is really about how to choose the parameters, not technically. This we can look up, but how do I choose the number? And 
for the time, well, there are often time limits. And what we recommend is that, well, it's hard to predict. You need to maybe run a series of jobs and get a feeling for how much time it will take. Hopefully you can extrapolate and then maybe add 20%. Don't make it too long just in case. It's, if I know that my job takes five minutes, it's not a good idea to ask for seven days because the job scheduler doesn't look, he, the job scheduler doesn't know, doesn't understand what I try to do here down here. The job scheduler doesn't know my calculation. It doesn't know my code. It will look at what I'm asking for. And if I ask for seven days, then imagine back to Tetris, imagine this gigantically long piece that, that lasts seven days and it will try to fit it somewhere into the resources. So it might then queue for a very long time. If the job is short, ask for a short time. Also, when you debug a problem, try to reduce the system size to reduce the queue time. And I will show you that in a, in a moment. And then in the next, so now in the next half an hour, we will really talk about how do I do this? If I, how do I decide how many cores? And how do I decide how much memory? We will show you that. Just catching up here with questions, whether anything that we should lift and discuss. And while I look there, I want to give a bit of a preview of what we will also do later in the course. One is that some jobs, if you look at them, they run for a long time, sometimes hours, days. But if you really look at them and see what do they really do is that they, they compute independent things one after the other. Sometimes there is a loop and we iterate over lots of tasks, lots of little units, but they are independent of each other or mostly independent of each other. And what, what we will do in, I think it will be the session number four of this course is we will show you how do you split it up into independent jobs. And maybe we also understand what can be the advantage because the advantage of doing that is that now the pieces that are now independent, they can fall down and they can start at the same time. And the scheduler has much more flexibility to fill up all the holes and we will maybe get the result sooner, the overall result. What is the disadvantage is that we might need to combine then the individual results into a combined result. So this is something for later. And one more thing I wanted to show is that I told you that all the jobs are rectangular or cubic cubic. But if you really look at them, if you really open them up and see what is the actual resource use. So here the gray thing, imagine the, like the whole rectangle is what I asked for, maybe four CPUs and a certain amount of time. But if, you, if I would open up the job and look into it, often the resource, the actual, what is actually used is not rectangular, but it varies over time. At the beginning, it, it uses very few CPUs. Then it uses all of the CPUs for a certain amount of time. And then at the end, it uses half the CPUs for a certain amount of time. And why did I show that? Because sometimes it can be beneficial to, so how could we solve this? If I, some, if I look at this job here, we are wasting almost half the resources. And one solution can be that we split up the job into pieces and run them one after the other because the pieces have different demands for resources. And one way to cut here would be, and I don't know whether you can see like my mouse pointer, but w I could cut here after two lines. And after two lines, I need a different resource. And then I could cut again after the fourth line, after the fourth row. Sometimes it can be beneficial to cut and then run them as independent, as separate steps, separate jobs and each of them has different resource demands. And I would add that if uh, if they are not independent, then you may use dependencies just to ensure that the middle block will start after the first one is finished, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, very good question on line 171. So do I have to ask, here I will 
also make that more visible. This question here, do I have to ask exactly the same amount of time and number of cores for a job to start to make a square block? So don't ask exactly for the amount of time, add a little bit more, because sometimes the CPUs are a little bit busier, it takes a little bit longer, so add 20%, 25%. But you ask for a certain amount of cores, certain amount of memory, certain amount of time. And even though your job internally might, the resource use might actually vary. But now we should really look at that. So let's talk about how do I choose the number of cores? And let's talk about how do I choose the right amount of memory? And for this, I will open up the material, keep the questions coming, and I will also open up my terminal and we'll try these things out. And why it matters, I will now not go into details, but it matters both for the cluster, because if you use, if you choose well, we will have a better resource use. More calculations will be able to finish. More papers will be published. It also matters for you as a researcher because your computation will start sooner and sooner and you will pay less. Although sometimes you don't pay for it. Sometimes it's the taxpayer who pays for it. So you don't want to ask for too many cores. You don't want to ask for too few, depending on what your goal is. And we don't want to waste resources. And the example project that I will use is, so I wrote an example code, but we don't have to, if you, if you want to have a look at it, you can, you can look at the code. We don't have to understand it. It's, it's a road, uh, code written in a language called C. The big picture is that we simulate planets, imagine a galaxy of planets, and they all, there is gravitational force, so all of these planets attract each other. They have random position. They start with a random position and random velocity. And what this code does is that it, it does a little time step. It computes the gravitational force between all of planets. It adjusts the velocity and moves them a little bit. And then again, another time step, it computes gravitational force. It moves the planets a little bit and we can, the code can use multiple cores and distribute the work across the, the cores. And then each of the cores will only move a smaller part of the planets. But we still need to exchange the positions of all the planets between, uh, between the cores. So that's the communication. The cores have to communicate through the high speed network and they have to exchange the positions. But whatever, this is, uh, this is just an example, but so, so I, will, I will build the code in a moment. We can run it. And the code, is, the code is called planets. What is nice is that I can here on the command line, I will be able to specify how many planets. So here I have 30,000 random planets in a galaxy and how many steps I want to run, 10,000 steps. And I can even make the network artificially slower. So I can increase the network penalty and simulate how long will it take if the network communication takes longer or less long. And here, it doesn't matter what the code does. What I want to find out is how, on how many cores should I run it? Here, somebody, somebody ran the code on four cores and it took a long time, 11,000 seconds. The question that we have here in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes is, should I choose four or 40 or eight or what is the setting? How do we find out? And how, so how do you, how do you approach this typically, Diana? And I can also, if, if you have such a question, how, yeah, do, we, so how think, do we approach the problem? Um, whenever, whenever I run a new piece of software, I would start to find a manual or some documentation, uh, some examples as usual, someone has run this before uh, using a certain, uh, um, size of the problem and it took that much time. I would uh, 
uh, try to do that, uh, try to do something uh, similar, maybe use the same input, uh, try to play around with different uh, sizes of the resources. I mean, different number of cores, maybe different number of nodes if it's parallelized. And of course, I mean, it may be different because all hardware is different. They're, they are going to be different interconnects. So it's really something that one should test. And once I know um, uh, how it scales me for a certain size of the problem, I, I should actually also uh, keep in mind that it may scale differently if the size of the problem is different. So just think, just because someone uh, found certain scale scaling for a certain type of simulation does not mean that it's going to be the same if I change the input. So do do your own tests, I would say. So yes. yeah, that's more or less what I would do. Thanks. And what I try to do here in the meantime is I download the code and I try to compile it. And this is, so we don't expect here the learners to do that or to even remember how to do that. That's not the point. And it's also really different on different clusters. This is something we can then try later in the exercise session. In the exercise session, we can actually all test it. I'm now loading a module on, on the cluster that I'm on, where, which, which can then compile the code. And I'm following, I will compile the code. All right, and now I have the I have the code here that I can run. And if I could now do this, but I don't want to wait 11,000 seconds. Uh, also, I want to now take uh, some of these job scripts that I was talking about earlier. And I want to create the job script. And now how do we select the number of cores? I will, I will call it run.sh and inside there, I have this example. I need to specify my project, which for me on, on my cluster happens to be some name. So this will not work for everybody else. I will start on eight cores. Nine minutes, just a, it's just a guess. And the first insight I wanted to everybody to take away is that If I look at this example that somebody gave me, 10,000 steps, the first thing I would probably do, I would think, do I really need 10,000 steps? And something I would probably test is how long does it take to run 10, 10 steps and 20 steps and 40 steps? And what I would then see is that in this case, the runtime is, it scales linearly with the number of steps. Each step approximately costs the same. So I don't need to run 10,000 steps and I don't need to wait for 11,000 seconds to, to try to run this and to study this. So the first thing I would do, and this is also what I did here, is I would do some testing and figure out that it might be actually okay to run just 100 tests, 100 steps. And this will, this will take a couple of seconds, minutes. What I try to achieve is a calculation that takes few minutes. I don't want to take, I, I don't want to wait hours. Few minutes. In this case, it will take maybe a minute. And then I often start with something. And later I will vary this. So I will change from eight to four and 16 and 32 and 64 and 128. And it doesn't have to be power of two, but this is just was what computer people like to do. Let me submit this and see what happens as batch. Sorry, what? Oh, sorry for all these commands. Uh, so what I have this run script and I can submit it. So now I send my job to the queue. If I want to see the how it is doing, it is now running. Nice. So this was a short job. It there was somewhere there was some resource available and it immediately started. And now I will impatiently repeat the command. And I think it will take, I don't know, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And I did that now for eight cores. Now it should take approximately 60 seconds. 
And I should just say that we are going to do uh, this uh, exercise in uh, in uh, two hours time. So you don't have to yep. do it immediately. So everybody so just watch. And we know that on different clusters, the scripts look slightly different, but we will then help you to help you with that. So later in the exercise, you can try this. You can then also try this with your own code. So instead of simulating planets, you can try to do this study with your own code. And the two steps were, what is the shortest time that I can get away with and still get a representative answer in terms of timing? And then run it on a series of cores. Did, did my job finish? It finished and then I can simulation completed. In this case, this took almost a minute on eight cores and I simulated 30,000 planets and 100 steps. If I would run it for 1,000 steps, it would probably take 600 seconds. And something I will now not do now, but you, what we can do later is we can really try it out instead of eight cores, 16 cores and 32 cores and, and so on and so on. Here, I made it a little bit more readable on the table. And what can we see from this table? So the, the big question is how many cores should I use? And what do I see here? We, if you run it on one core, it takes 420 seconds. We double the resources, we have the time. We double the resources, we still have the time. We still have the time, still have the time. And now, now it's not anymore half the time. You see that I don't, doubling the resources at some point doesn't, doesn't cut the time in half anymore. And something interesting happens here is that I went to lots of cores, 256, and the time even goes up. And why is that? Because at some point, the communication to update the positions of the planets, to, to communicate between all the CPUs at some point is more costly than the computation. And in this case, where would you, how many CPUs would you choose, Diana? Where would you stop? I would stop at 16. Yeah. But it also depends on the number of cores on the cluster, uh, because yeah. uh, if it's better that uh, we fill up uh, um, uh, the uh, node, then uh, maybe 32 is a better number. So it really depends on on the cluster configuration. So yeah, but somewhere there, 16 yeah. or 42. And it's important that you think in time spent per number of cores. Yeah, and if, so, you, if you don't, if you are in no hurry, maybe eight is fine too. But we clearly see that in this case, it, does, it doesn't make any sense to run this on 256 cores. So here I would also choose uh, 8 or 16, maybe 32 if there is a deadline and PhD has to be ready by Friday afternoon. But you know, we, we don't move on much further. So what is the, the takeaway? Here the takeaway is two things. It's both for timing and for debugging, it can be really useful to reduce the time of the job so that it's, so that this information is still meaningful. That is one skill and the other skill is run it on a series of course. And you don't have to do this for every job that you try to do. I do this only if I have, if I plan to do a hundred similar jobs then before running these 100 similar jobs, I do this study for one of those. And then all my 99 other jobs, I know what to choose. I know that I should choose 16. And I know that it will take so and so many seconds. So this calibration doesn't have to do for every single job. That would be unreasonable as well. And thanks for all the questions. Thanks to my colleagues for answering them. And we have now, I would, I'd like to take maybe 10 more minutes on talking about the memory part. And then we will take a break and talk about disk. So now I will switch over to this episode here, which is now that we know how to choose the number of cores. And this is really a method that really almost always works. 
I want to show you how do I choose the memory. Because sometimes you have to. Especially if you need more memory than the processor has. Let's open this up and let's try this out. Why does it matter? Similar motivation. It's uh, if you ask for excessive number of memory, you might block resources for, for other people. If you pay for the resource use, you might pay too much. And you, your job may wait long or forever in the queue until these resources become available. Also later in the course, we will take a problem and we will chop it up into smaller problems and we will try to run them in parallel at the same time. We will try to have jobs that are independent and can compute simultaneously. And if I'm not careful about the memory, I might severely limit my ability to parallelize my job. So it matters often. And I, will, I want to show you how I do that. And this is a method that maybe I will show you two methods that are probably available on most of the clusters that we are on. So again, before running many similar jobs, I typically calibrate. I don't do that for every computation, but if I, if I plan to run 100 similar computations, I do some calibration study. And here, what I want to calibrate here is the memory. And the example code that I will use now is a Python code. Again, this is something you can try later in the exercise. And this Python code, it, it computes, you can tell it to compute 5,000 random numbers between minus one and one and to sum them up. You can also give it a certain time to wait between computing and summing. And I will show you why I did that. But let me go to, I will now go to a different cluster for reasons. So now I'm on a different cluster. Again, you don't, you are not expected to remember autotype. I'm on a different Norwegian cluster. I will create a new folder for this. And I will, I will try to run this Python code. Example. We don't, we don't have to look at the Python code. The Python code creates random numbers, sums them up, prints the result. Now, I should really. I should run a script for this. I should write a script for this. Um, I should not run it directly on the command line, or oh, sorry, directly on the login node. So I will again write a little script, which I will adjust, and we will in the exercise adjust to our clusters that we are on. I will again call it run.sh. And let me discuss what we see here. I need to adjust my account. In my case, it happens to be this one. I give it a name, five minutes, absolutely enough. On this cluster, I have to specify memory. And I don't actually know how much. I will start with something, two and a half gigabyte, 2,500 megabyte. For this example, I don't need more than one core. It will be it will be run on one so-called task or one core. And now I could run it like this. I could sum up. Here I want to sum up lots of numbers. How many are these? Million. Fifty million numbers. I want to sum up fifty million random numbers. I want to wait for ten seconds and then print me the result. I could run it like this. But one tool that is available almost everywhere, which is really nice is that you can put this one in front of any any of your commands and it will measure the so-called high watermark 
of the memory use. You can think of like when you imagine there is like a flooding, you know, the water goes up and then the water disappears again. And then you can see how far did the water reach. So that's a high water mark. And this tool will tell me this. So my code will allocate memory and it will tell me what was the highest memory allocation during the runtime. Let me submit this and let's see what what happens. So again, I send it to the queuing system. I send it to Slurm to, and again, it was really short. It needs only one core. It started immediately. Nice. I expect this to run. So I ask for 10 seconds. It will actually run for a little bit longer than 10 seconds because the allocating fifth allocating and computing 50 million random numbers will take a little bit of time. It takes a few seconds. So it's still running 28 seconds, 31 seconds. And it will soon finish. Still running. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, maybe it will take a minute. But it gives me a chance to look at questions here on the notes. Thanks a lot for all my colleagues for answering. And thank you all for the good questions. And we are maybe five minutes away from a break. All right, job finished. Let, what we have here is my Python code, my job script, but now I also have an output from Slurm. And I will, let's see what is in this output. There is stuff here. Okay, this doesn't belong here. <laughs> oh, but the important thing with, when putting USR slash bin slash time minus V in front of your command, you will get this block here. And there are lots of numbers, but the one that I'm interested in is this one, maximum resident set size. So this tells me that the code used, so this is kilobyte, so this would be, it would be almost 2000 megabyte, so approximately two gigabyte. That was the highest memory allocation during the run of the code. So that's one tool that is almost always available. This is the tool that I use to figure out what is the highest memory allocation. And now I know, and now for all my jobs, I can take this number and maybe add 20% to it just to be on the safe side. And then, you know, if you need to specify it. And in the material, I will show you, there is one more method, which is I think available on all Slurm scheduled clusters. I think so too. And I will try that method. It will tell. It will give me a similar answer, but there is a risk to it. S act. I think this means maybe S accounting. Then the job number. My job number here was this one. And then, I I I'm only interested in this maximum resident set size, which is the memory. And in this case, it tells me the, uh, the result. It's again, almost approximately two gigabyte. The problem with this tool is that it uses sampling. Every on, on our clusters in Norway, every 30 seconds, it asks the job, what is the memory that you use right now? Aha. Uh -huh. And 30 seconds later, it asks again. And if the job is shorter than 30 seconds, well, let's try. What happens if the job is shorter than 30 seconds? Let's make it shorter. Let's remove a zero here because that will make it shorter. And let's add only, I don't know, five seconds wait time. And I will submit again. It will finish way sooner because to compute 
10 times less fewer number of sticks. I think it should finish hopefully in very soon. Now it finished. 12 seconds in. I have now a second output. The, the result from, so this number here is still correct. In this case, it uh, the the memory demand was 10 times lower. It's only 200 megabytes. But if I ask Slurm, uh, and now I need to replace the number by this number, it will tell me that, whoa, ugh, why is that? No, okay, because I made a mistake. It's not 34, it's 44. This is the right number, 44, because what I expected to see that the memory is zero. So this tool tells me that my job consumes zero memory, and that's not true. But to be fair to this tool, this tool uses sampling every 30 seconds. It, ha it had no chance to, to see the memory demand. And what I want you to take, take away from here is that depending on which tool you use, it might be using sampling. And if there is a memory peak, this tool might miss it. The other one, the other tool, US, USR bin time, this one, to my knowledge, in my experience, will always report you the high memory watermark. It doesn't use sampling, not in the same way. And maybe there are other tools. Uh, we can share them on the notes. We can then later share them in the exercise session. And again, in the exercise session, the goal will be that you can try this out with my example Python code. But what is maybe more interesting for you is to try this out with your own code and figure out how much memory does it really use. Yes, exactly. And sometimes it's uh, it's good that uh, you check the memory requirements for different sizes of your arguments and maybe get an idea, try to extrapolate possibly and get an idea on what you would actually need for your real simulations. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, this is easier to do if uh, if there is, uh, if it's linear or uh, or uh, square, uh, but um, but it's a, it's a good uh, way to uh, try to estimate that. And uh, as Salman said, I mean, uh, at different clusters, you may have different tools which can do this uh, memory profiling and uh, we'll definitely talk about more uh, in the exercise session, so. And sometimes we get asked for a lot of memory. Uh, and sometimes the answer is to change the code. And many of the people who work in, who are instructors here and in the code refinery project really like to help you also improve the code. So for, the, for those of you who write Python, uh, there is a little bonus that you can see that just by changing two characters in the code, memory demand can go from a lot to almost zero. And good questions there. Can we, is there any way that we can change the sampling? Uh, to my knowledge, the user cannot change it. Uh, we, can, we can change the configuration of the cluster, but it happens to be configured for 30 seconds. So at least to my knowledge, it's not something I can change. But please correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't want to eat more into the break time. I think so many good questions, so many good answers. I suggest we take a break and then we talk about disk. And how long will the break be? Maybe it's, maybe the my studio colleagues can help me. Is it 15 minutes? Should we be back at 15 past past the hour? Is but is that also right for the instructors who come after me? Maybe they can have a say. Yeah, 15 minutes works. Good. So then we'll be back 15 minutes past the hour. We will talk about this. And I will also then here have a look at all your questions and add more, more answers to it. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully the big picture got clear, the thinking got clear, the details we can always look up. Thanks to Diana also for doing this here, for going through the lesson here with me. See you and in yeah, uh, now 14 minutes. See you.